Hi, Sin. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing just fine. I'm actually close to Peachy Keen, I think. Almost at the Peachy Keen level. <laughs> well, great. Uh, well, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you were on the uh, one of the panels for Origins remotely last week. Uh, yeah. We, we, uh, we got to stop by and see some of the stuff going on there. Um, I know you teach and you're prolific with your own game design. And uh, it's been, a, I'm assuming, a good year for you with, with, the, with the amazing stuff that's come out this year. Yeah, so. it's actually been remarkably good. It's, uh, you know, you, you'd think that the pandemic changes everything. And it, it did, it has. Um, but for games, what it's done, it's re- reinvigorated RPGs um, because <laughs> RPGs you can play um without having to be face to face it was so funny i was just talking to my friend matt kent who is the uh artist illustrator writer behind mind management one of the games that we've made yeah. uh jay cormier and i made that for yeah. him with him um and it's again another game that's doing great uh during the pandemic uh because we released a solo app for it but today he was saying because we're, we're going to be doing a, a role-playing game at some point together and Matt is like, you know, I just don't play enough role playing games. I said, Matt, dude, we can play that over Zoom. He goes, Oh my God, you're right. <laughs> and he just had never thought yeah. about the fact that you could play an RPG over, you know, a video conferencing tools. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the pandemic has really changed, I think, how people see RPGs, the number of people that got into RPGs. I know, you know, just monetarily, we're talking money, that uh, Watsi, Wizards of the Coast, had a great great 2020 um during the first few months of the pandemic because of you know the prevalence of dungeons and dragons and all that jazz so yeah it's been good and then a lot of people in the industry have been like well we can't ship stuff because there's a big shipping crisis so we might as well just design stuff and make stuff we'll get ready for you know have a whole line of stuff to come when the shipping crisis is sort of averted which we don't know when that's happening but you know, it's it's trending a little bit downwards right now, so that's a good sign. RPGs are awesome for that reason. I I, uh, I finally got into a regular game that meets every week, except for when somebody is sick because of the pandemic. Right, right. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people started up. Well, you know, and and it's like doing it on Zoom. It's like you mean I don't have to travel? You mean I don't have to like bring snacks? You mean I don't have to wear pants? <laughs> And they're like, yeah, I'm down to try this, you know, dicey dragon game. That's fun. So, yeah, it's, it's been a good thing. I've had like uh, three games, uh, three or four games over the course of the pandemic uh, that have, you know, run and played and, you know, petered out and then start a new one. And that one peters out a little bit because they all kind of run their course. Um, it's a little harder to keep interest up when you're not face to face for some things and then for other things it's just good to get started and a lot of people who just said i've never played an rpg can you teach me how to play an rpg it's like yeah let's do that so um and then other things it's like well we're making this rpg we might as well play it for a couple months straight so we've also done that kind of stuff which is oh, nice um so we, i i know that i have this problem sometimes um right and does too uh Sometimes when, I have a lot of problems. when you only <laughs> read something, you don't know how to pronounce it correctly. So help me out here. But, uh, is it Zhangxi or, or how do you? you is oh, it, uh, it depends. But uh, okay. in in Mandarin, it would be Zhangxi. Zhangxi. Yeah. Okay. Close. You need the, oh. the tonal inflections, but you're, you're, I am so bad. so bad at the tonal. That my, is okay. So am I. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And my, my my cousins lived overseas for a few years. They lived in, in Taipei and stuff. And they came back and they're like, "Oh, you say everything wrong." Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just totally different once once you're like living in the space where you hear it all the time, right? I worked at a Thai restaurant for off and on for like eight years, and I just accepted. Like I'm just not gonna get it. Like yeah, I try, I try it. really hard, but it's like they're yeah, tonal. Yeah, and, yeah and I think the thing is that uh, a lot of people are just happy that you try. Yeah, right. I, I that's all I really care about. Are you trying? Good. Then that's good. And as long as you're trying and you're humble about it, like if you're trying and you're wrong, you think you're doing it right, and you're like, you know, 
I don't know, boasting about it, then like, we're going to talk, we're going to have a talk, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you're, yeah. if you're just earnestly trying and it's not so great, but it's, it's passable, like we're going to, you know, be pretty happy that you're actually trying. <laughs> well, that's, that's very kind. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, my, my bigger question was, yeah. Uh, besides, yeah how you, besides how to pronounce it. Yeah. 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 Uh, did you, did you play that one? Uh, during the, the pandemic oh yeah a lot <laughs> oh wow. yeah. okay 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 yeah I mean, we, we totally played that um because it was well i mean so so it's all a blur right now to be honest it's like was that during the pandemic or was that just after it started or just before it started mm -hmm. um the there's definitely we definitely did play it uh it wasn't necessarily during our heavy testing time but we definitely did play it you know we, we had games with backers and things like that so yeah there was there were a few games of that um Jiangsha is set up more for short campaigns and one shots versus mm -hmm. like this big long ongoing thing um so that's what they were they were shorter campaigns or one shots that we did with people um for that monster game. of the week yeah yeah less monster of the week more of like hey the story's done and that's that's as much as we wanted to tell about it or as much as people wanted to tell about it um the way that it goes in juncture at the end of it there's like questions you know what do you think your character's going to do in the future how are they going to you know meet their hopes and dreams a lot of it's about hopes and dreams mm -hmm. uh, because it's an immigrant story really yeah. at the core of it it's a story of you know people who immigrate to one place from another and usually there's hopes and dreams attached to that. Like, otherwise, why would you pick up your family, sell all your worldly possessions or carry them on your back across oceans just to go to somewhere where you weren't wanted, right? There's got to be a reason. And a lot of those reasons are hopes and dreams of a better life. And what does that look like? And some of that stuff is better not played out. Some of that stuff is better to be aspirational or to be discussed. And do you think your character you know, would get there, you know, well, I hope they do. And I think this is what would happen or things like that uh, can be actually more meaningful than the play-by-play uh, -play kind of style of uh, RPG play where it's like, and then I go to college and then I, you know, sit at a desk and listen to my professor and then I roll for that, roll to see if you heard anything, you know, like, what, why are we doing that? Um, let's just say that, yeah, you did that, but then what happens after that? Mm -hmm. So uh, the denouement, the, the closing part of the game is, is very hope and dream driven, very aspirational. So yeah, it's, it's not something that really has to go much further than the conflict uh, with the hopping vampires. How did you find them? How did you stop them? What did they do? What did you do? And then because of your success or failure, uh, that what happened to your lives? That's the, that's really what happens in that game. Um, and so it's, it's just meaningful uh, to stop after a certain point of play, I think. Um, you know, like in D and D, when all of a sudden I, I I now own a castle with henchmen, and I have to now count all of the iron rations that my henchmen are using. Like that to me is not fun. So I don't really want to play D and D past all of that. I also don't particularly like you know god level D and D where you have a twentieth level whatever and I can kill a god. It's like that's not my level of that's not my kind of fun. I like fragile heroes who are like mm -hmm. really actually, you know, every move is critical to them. So, and I know you can GM that to the way that it is. It's just, you know, I was never really into uh, like in Marvel superheroes, yeah. not super into things like, well, even the Eternals that are coming up, the cosmic level stuff, which is why I don't love the Avengers um, and Thanos and all that kind of stuff, Adam Warlock. Uh, they weren't my favorite comics from Marvel. My favorite comics were like the, Marvel Knight stuff that Netflix did. So like Daredevil and Punisher and Iron Man. Uh, it's not Iron Man. Iron Man's okay, but Iron Fist. And although they did not do that very well. Oh my um, goodness, yeah. okay. Power Man, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. That's what I would prefer to read and, and play in and do all that kind of stuff. So yeah, not a big fan of cosmic level power stuff. So great. Yeah. Um, Man, you, you, uh, you're just making me think of so many different things. Uh, but what, so, what are you playing right now as far as RPGs go? Though? As far as RPGs go, I'm playing Masks, um, playing okay. a lot of Masks. Uh, masks is one of my favorite systems because I think it does 
some really neat things. Uh, PBTA is, uh, you know, in my opinion, one of the better systems to introduce people to role playing. And mm-hmm. the idea of narrative control and the idea of like failing forward and simple dice, you know, no, no tables to look at. Um, there's a couple of things that are a little difficult about uh, some PPTA games, like in masks, you know, try to get players not to say, I'm going to do this move. And instead just talk and mm-hmm. expect the GM like me to say, Oh, it sounds like you're trying to pierce the mask. Let's roll for that. Um, that's hard for my players because uh, they're new. Uh, and so it's, it's really interesting to try to get them almost conditioned to just don't say the move name, just, just talk. Um, so that's fun. But uh, they've been going, we've been going on for a long time now and they've built this whole world out. And I ask them, you know, all, all the time to say, well, what do you see? And, you know, what do you hear? And who's that over there? And what's their name? And, and they've built this whole thing. And we have a discord uh, mm-hmm. where we talk during the week, you know, every session uh, is like every other, every week we have a session every week, but between them, they're writing in the discord saying, what do you guys think of a villain called this? And his powers could be that. And we're like, yeah, that's great. Let's, and I try to incorporate them every now and then. And yeah, it's fun. So masks is a good one uh, to introduce new people to, I think, um, especially if they really like angsty teenage superhero antics, which is my favorite genre of superheroes ever. So there you go. Um, what else have I been playing? Well, Avatar, The Last Airbender, or Avatar Legends, sorry, that's the official name, uh, because I'm writing for that project. Um, and that is a really interesting, again, um, Masks um, was Brandon Conway, and, and, and so is Avatar. You know, it's the Magpie team, and then a bunch of writers that are working on that. So, like myself, uh, uh, Daniel... Um, James, uh, Mendes Hodes. Um, who else? Uh, Julian Kim, Sharang Biswa, lots of people. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be really cool to see it, it all come together. Um, it's got some neat combat in it that is definitely different than a lot of PPDA combat, which is uh, very much, you know, the only time you get hit is when you choose to kind of not do something else <laughs> uh so like in masks when you roll to you know directly engage a threat you if you roll one success a lot of times the person picks to oh i dodge the blow instead of doing all the other things that they could do but if they really want to do one of the other things then they might get hit by the other the villain so um again you know characters in masks aren't super fragile but they're not meant to be they, they get you get your labels just pulled apart and you get conditions and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit different than hit points. There's not really hit points in masks. Um, so what else have I been playing? Oh, uh, Blades in the Dark. We have oh, a bi-weekly game of Blades uh, with a bunch of other game designers and writers. Um, and that's super fun because, uh, I mean, I just, just the Forge in the Dark system where you retcon kind of whatever you're carrying and whatever you did. Don't you remember when I did that? Um, I think it's a really intuitive system where you're just right in the thick of things in in Medea Res and you're going and you don't have to think about encumbrance and you don't have to think about, you know, how many silver pieces did I spend on those climbing spikes? It's like, I have climbing spikes. You know, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to climb the wall using my climbing spikes. Mark off your climbing spikes. Now you have four slots of encumbrance left. Great. We're done. Um, and so I'm more of a story player that I am a rolling dice and calculating and min-maxing my character player. So uh, I prefer that as a GM as well. And I I like systems that lend itself to that, uh, where you don't have to, where you don't have the dissonance between, you know, critical hit tables and how many plus ones do I get and all that kind of stuff versus the story and the narrative and failing and all that kind of stuff, where I think good stories come out of failure um, and when you're power gaming in some of the other, uh, maybe more traditional RPG systems, I don't know. It just doesn't feel the same uh, because your character has hit points and your character, you know, can easily die. And, I, and it's not that I, like I said, I like fragile characters, um, but uh, I think some of the systems tend to be a little bit punishing and against storytelling, really good storytelling and good narrative in order to, you know, survive 
which is yeah, yeah. sort of weird, I guess. Yeah. Cons my dumb stat. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, right? I mean, I, I think that's an okay thing to have as a dump stat, but you know, logic would say never ever pick that as your dump stat because you know that one D four of hit points you get as a level character isn't going to carry you too far. If you don't have yeah. high constitution. So, I mean, I, I, I've played character I, characters. Diane's great. I, you know, it's good for the story. I mean, I'm not trying to get my characters killed, but you know, no, if you play a guy with con as his dump stat, he's like a half lane with some daggers and you know, his motto is, you know, kill everything before it has a chance to hit you. <laughs> that pans out for like a year in real life. And then eventually yeah. you get hit real hard and, you don't Character come back to God. Yes. <laughs> um, so <laughs> when you come to designing, uh, whether it's uh, board games or RPGs, is there a difference for you how you approach design? Um, not really. Uh, okay. I'm I'm pretty mechanically oriented. So uh, let's for say Avatar Legends, I'll be doing a lot of the techniques and moves. Um, more than the narrative part of it, although I, I'm a very good writer, um, that's that tends to be where people put me, which is fine. Into the mechanics, uh, but really, 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 uh, over the last fifteen odd years of, of doing this, I've really found that I look for an experience before I look for anything else. Um, mm -hmm. I believe really that games are curated experiences more than anything else, and. I want to use the thematics of the game and the mechanical natures of the game to really support that experience and make sure that experience shines through. So I don't really think that an RPG is different than a LARP is different than a board game is different than a card game is different than a mobile app or whatever, because really at the end for each of those things, I am designing a specific experience that I want players to feel. Uh, and then the differences become what tools do I have to do that when I am making an RPG versus a LARP versus a board game versus a card game, right? There's just a different tool set that I can pick from or choose from. And, and, and these days, you know, uh, because I think all the terms are getting broader in what they mean in some ways, mm -hmm. I can use different tools that I would not have been able to use you know, maybe a couple of years ago, because I think gamers are becoming more well-versed in other types of games to the point where they're not resistant to having, you know, narrative storytelling in a board game. And they're not resistant to having a deck of cards in an RPG, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I think we're seeing that nice hybridization uh, to a comfortable level where we still know it's an RPG, but it has some board gaming elements, which is what a lot of people saw when they saw Jiangsha because I designed it with banana. So it was like, yeah, there's going to be a board and we're going to have, you know, abilities that turn on and off based on how you care for your restaurant uh, or whether or not you took psychic damage from the, from the vampires. Right. So we have these, we have the ways that that happens um, laid out more like a board game than an RPG. Like in an RPG, it might say mark one fatigue or something like that. In Jiangsha, it's like place a card over the slot that has your ability in it. And now the, the card that you couldn't finish covers up the ability you had in that slot. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So we're using just more um, tactile sensibility that we get from things like board games where you have lots of counters and markers and whatnot to have the effects of tracking information uh, that is done in just a, a more physical, tactile way um, than like pen and paper. That's all. It's just a different way of doing things. So, <laughs> what are you trying to make somebody feel in Belfort? Oh, in Belfort? What am I trying to make people feel like? Like you're an elf or a dwarf. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, I, I. So, Belfort was our very first uh, published game, which is not entirely true, but also is true at the same time. It is the first game that got signed, but it was okay. the second game that po got published because the second game we got signed was a party game that you know takes like you know a couple months to actually okay. just put through the ringer and go, whereas Belfort took you know a full six eight months of development to get it to the place where the publishers would say, "Yep, yeah, let's press print." Um, so Belfort is a game that is, it's like a worker placement game, um, but also an area control game. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, 
if you've played it and, and maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but if you've played it and you play it at a high level, you'll, you'll know when I say that the most important part of the experience is like any contractor <laughs> fighting for, you know, the position that you are jockeying for a position to get ahead of the other person at the right times at the critical times. Uh, so the neat thing about Belfort is because it uses worker placement and because it uses area control, you don't actually want to always be first to play. You also don't want to be last to play. So worker placement games, typically um, the first player has a benefit because they place their, their piece unopposed in the worker slot that they want. All of the world is open to them. They go, oh, I really need this resource. Boom, there goes my worker. That's where it's going. I get that automatically. The next person, they said, oh, I wanted that P. I wanted that too, but now I can't have it. But in terms of area control, it's usually the last player to build or place in an area that has what we call the hammer, right? Not <laughs> It's not a Belfort term. That's just, you know, I think that's because I'm from Canada and we like curling. You have the hammer, you have the last shot. And the last shot basically says, okay, looking at the game state right now, I have the choice of building this thing in maybe, well, in any of the five districts in, in the city where can I maximize my score? Because nobody is going to play after me. And if nobody plays after me, that is immutable. Where I place it dictates the score for everybody now. So there's a point in Belfort, every turn, you can change your turn order mid-turn. You can start first and then end up being the last to do this other thing. Uh, and that's the art and science of Belfort. Uh, it is really jockeying for position. So that's the experience that I wanted to create there. Um, and not a lot of people get it because it's buried under a lot of stuff um, at first anyways, but people who've played it a lot, people who played it at a very high level, it's like, yes, you need to jockey all the time. You can't be complacent with being, for, being first is not always good. You want to be last at certain points. And uh, because of how the scoring works, like it's like um, you score every so often, not every round. You want to be last on those very specific rounds. But you can start first in that round and then buy your way to being last uh, by using your workers to change your, your turn order, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot deeper than people think it is um, at the surface. It's not just about being elves and dwarves, although it is. Uh, and master elves and master dwarves. I mean, that, that, that's part of the reason I ask, because that, that's a really interesting... Uh, experience so you get to that level of play and, and, and you're 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 feeling something that's totally different than the setting right i mean maybe maybe not depending on the person but for the person who's playing at that level of jockeying for position and all that and, and seeing where they want to go you're you're feeling a different sort of thing i think at least i think i am than i am when i'm placing myself purely in a fantasy RPG setting or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I think because the, uh, I always think of myself as like a foreman or like a, well, a master builder, a master yeah. architect that I'm ordering people around. And uh, I always think of um, that, like I'm not an individual worker. I am a person who controls a bunch of workers and I have to use them optimally. I'm a big, big fan of optimization yeah. uh which which is bad in rpgs um because it, it kind of can you know okay. stagnate role playing but it's good in board games because it scores you lots of points mm -hmm. um and so that's what that was actually all about it's like it's an optimization engine where you're trying to really really um, maximize your output on every turn because of your turn order placement so yeah and, and you know i do i think of myself as being in a fantasy world it's funny because that was the game from day one like it's never changed its name uh you know a lot of times people say oh don't worry about the name the publisher will change it oh don't worry about the theme the publishers change it i've we've actually never had that really happen to us um so it's it's not that it's not true because it does definitely happen um but for us it's never really really happened to that degree so it was always you know you're you're foreman working with uh fantastical creatures as your workers and um you're building the city of belfort it was always that um so the experience for me has always been 
kind of locked in my head that way. Whether or not it's translated to players, I think is just a uh, function of my skill over time. Like, like I said, that was like our first game signed, second game published. So it's it may not do it as well as some of our newer games where it's like, yeah, that's I feel like I'm, you know, whatever I'm supposed to be. But I get that, yeah. So you you worked on a couple of um, IPs I saw, and um, with Avatar Legends, you have um, an opportunity. You're going to be working on something that is a very established IP. On a little side tangent, they said that um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in like the '80s was one of the last television shows that. Um, like a whole, like the whole U.S. kids kind of shared together. Then kind yeah. of cable came along and diversified stuff. Um, my kids recently watched Avatar at the um, recommendation of somebody who was working with me on a job site. Who was like a twenty-five <laughs> year old girl. You know, she was on a job front of ours, um, and she was like, "Oh, you should have your kids watch Avatar." So we've my daughters watched Avatar twice now. Um, yeah, so- I mean, I, I definitely think the streaming services have made that possible. Now that a lot of people are turning off cable and just subscribing to one or two of their favorite, um, you know, streaming services yeah. and and Prime because you know you want the free shipping, I guess. Um, <laughs> if you have a couple of those, like Disney Plus, Netflix, and and Prime, you've got access to a lot of old cartoons, um, and then they're making reboots of a lot of them too, right? So. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to see uh, all of the the nostalgia value of things like uh, Cool Mini or not just did He-Man. Um, and there's like, obviously on the Netflix, there were two He-Man reboots just in the last year. Yeah. Uh, so the nostalgia factor is huge. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a great point that Ninja Turtles was probably one of the last big ones that an entire generation followed um and you see that you know renegade is doing an rpg and card games and stuff for gi joe um and for transformers right so those are going to be huge there's going to be a big big deal and uh congrats to everybody at renegade and elisa who is the team lead for those they're they're gonna rock it it's gonna be great but yeah back to ip sorry um you had some more points about ips i think well my my Point question. Um, so, so you're going to be working like Avatar is kind of like a shared, like a zeitgeistish, you know, compared to it would be probably, in my opinion, one of the closer uh, turtles for today's generation. And you'll be work. You're working on the RPG, yeah, for it, which is probably going to introduce a ton of people in the next five years. 10 years to role playing. And I just wanted to know how excited, challenged, worried, you know, like all the above. Of, <laughs> this, what? All the above. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I had the extreme privilege of being, I think, one of the only humans on the planet uh, to work on multiple games in that universe. So I also did the board game for the Legend of Korra Pro Banding Arena. Um, which is a two-player deck-building miniature combat game, really. It, it's, that's what it is, um, where you run two teams. So one, one player plays three uh, benders on one side, another, team, another player plays three benders on the other side, and it's the pro-bending from the actual the sport that they play in um, Republic City during the Korra series, um, which is it's super interesting and super fun. And I, I really like what what the studio did is they made Avatar. And then a couple of years later, they said, OK, all of our fans are this much older. We need to make a story that's that much older now for them. Right. Uh, and so they did a really cool job of that. Um, which is very different than say, you know, Star Wars, which is, you know, we're always aiming at this target demographic. And if other target demographics happen to like it, cool. But, you know, people always have to be reminded that Star Wars is for kids and it was made for kids um, in a lot of ways anyways, uh, where, um, you know, why do we have the pod race and why do we have, you know, this scene with all the people at the cantina and funny creatures and weird animation being added well because 
for kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were those parts anyways were for kids. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, the team has been really um, working hard on making Avatar Legends very much, uh, you know, a first introductory RPG, but one that has enough meat on it to satisfy, you know, experienced RPG players, et cetera, et cetera. So it is this hard balance. There, there's a lot of work going into uh, making sure it is as approachable as possible mm-hmm. while still fulfilling the wants and needs and desires of people who've been role-playing for many years, but have never, ever been able to do it in the official avatar world. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of other games that kind of mimic it or, you know, are, are a tribute to or an homage to or a prestigious of uh, those types of things. Um, but this is the official one. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's got all the history and all that kind of stuff. It'll be it'll be really interesting to see people engage with it. And the other thing that is is very interesting about uh, RPGs. And this happens in, in board games too. There are tons of people who buy board games and just like never play them for some reason. Like they leave them in shrink and you know, I'll get to it when I get to it. Uh, and similarly, there's tons of people who buy, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily one of those people, but I definitely do have a whole shelf. Like it's right over there of um, RPGs that I've never played, but I've read like copious, like I've read maybe three or four times through the book, through the source book, because I love the world or I love the mechanics, but I've never had the chance to play it with a group. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who just like Avatar and they're using this like as a source book for, you know, just fulfilling their knowledge of what is it really like in bossing say, you know, or whatever. Right. So uh, this book will answer hopefully some of those questions for them. Um. Yeah, I mean, on that note, I, I know somebody that doesn't really own very many board games, but they have Legend of, uh, of Korra, and uh, <laughs> because they love Avatar so much. Oh yeah, yeah, like that's that's why they got it. Um, I, I, uh, I, that's interesting to like just read. I, I've never thought about that. Like, it, it, is that the same thing to just read through a source book several times? I don't uh, know if it's it, the same thing, but it's close. Is it? <laughs> It's oh, close because yeah. it's it yeah. hasn't been played, right? So it's uh, you're playing it in your head, which is I guess one step up. I think it's I think it's better to buy a book and read it, but not play the game than it is yeah. to buy a box of stuff and leave it in shrink wrap on your shelf. Right. Um, <laughs> a lot of people will call that their shelf of shame. We we choose to be more positive and call it your shelf of opportunity. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean the same <laughs> thing with RPGs. I I'm like I, like I said, I have a whole shelf of opportunity. Now some of those books are games that you know nobody that I know will ever play because it, it's just this weird esoteric game that I thought was cool, uh, mm-hmm. or that I, you know picked up when it's like on sale. Like you know, often uh, times that you go to a game store in a different city, and they have like a box of you know. Five dollars source books from other print games that nobody will play with you anymore. Those yeah. are the things I buy. It's like, oh, cool! I remember wanting that when I was twelve years old. <laughs> I'm going to buy it now and read it. Uh, and a lot of that stuff is for me, like, like you know how you have nightmare fuel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like that. It's like nightmare fuel, except for RPGs. It's RPG fuel because I think about it all the time. I'm reading this book and say, oh, what if I modernize it? How can I update that? And what can I take from here? Or, you know, what can inspire me in this book that is really cool? Um, because that, I mean, RPG is more than board games. Our, board games have to work. Board games, that's a that's the problem. That's why they take so long to develop and design is that they have to work. They're expected to work. Whereas an RPG um, is more like a, like I said, it's like a toolkit in some ways where I get these rules for combat i have a magic system here oh but i hate encumbrance i I literally hate encumbrance we're never gonna count you know encumbrance in our game ever it's like can you carry more than two shields no can you carry more than one suit of armor only if you're like super strong that's it that's like the basic rules of of this is it is it reasonable to, to walk around with what you're carrying okay then i'll let you do that if it's unreasonable then you're moving at half speed or you have a you know, your armor class is reduced or whatever, or increased depending on what system you're playing. Um, so yeah, I, I think role-playing games are a little easier to play in that way of your experience at, you know, f- hacking the system. Right. Whereas board games, you can't hack. <laughs> you, otherwise it'll break. Um, yeah. unless you, you know, house rule, you can house rule stuff. That's okay. Uh, but in general, it, it still has to work out of the box. 
um, which is very different design wise for me personally. Um, the amount of development and play testing that goes into uh, a board game is like months and months and months and months more than an RPG. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do that for RPGs or that you can't do that for RPGs, but at some level, RPG books, like I said, a lot of them sit on shelves read but not played as the game. So does the system have to work? Yes. But I also know that people are going to pick and choose what they want out of that game mm-hmm. to fit their table and their players, which is very different than a board game. Way different. Yeah. If somebody tries to like exploit a, you know, RPG, like a third party RPG, you just like, yeah, okay. We're not gonna do that. Like <laughs> well, but yeah, the I mean, rules say yeah, that I a, my character's yeah. a god. Yeah, there's an there's a there's a GM in a lot of them to mitigate that factor. Whereas mm-hmm. in a board game, uh, there's usually not somebody who controls the game. Um, and I, I mean, I I do subscribe to the idea that GMs are just other players who are doing other things, mm-hmm. but they are also you know facilitating the rules part of it more so than the other players are. So, yeah, I, I think that's more that. What I was thinking along the lines of is that you can have a successful RPG book that you don't ever use for the game, but you use it as source material for your other games. And you oh, yeah. It, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, tons of stuff like that. I know yeah. people who are like, well, I'm going to buy the, the Avatar game, but I'm going to play in a whatever, like a D20 system or a tiny D6 system or whatever, because, or a PIP system, because they don't particularly love PBTA. Mm-hmm. Right. And that more power to you, man. I don't really, you know, whatever you do is what you do. Whatever you love is what you love. Um, I, I happen to like PBTA, so I will play it in PBTA style. Um, but yes, I've definitely bought like, <laughs> speaking of Ninja Turtles, um, you know, um, <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the uh, Palladium game. Mm, uh, oh, wow. When I was a kid, uh, I had all of it, and we never played by Palladium rules because for some reason we just didn't understand them. And we were kids. Like, we were like, I don't know, how old was I when that was? Like, maybe 13. Um, and we had been playing Dungeons and Dragons for a long time. And so we're just like, let's just, let's just roll D20s. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do that um, because we, I don't know, something about the Palladian system was not, not clicking with us. So we totally did that. <laughs> totally did that um, to the point where we were like, okay, now let's get these Robotech. Cause they also had a Robotech uh, source book around the same time. It's like, Oh, let's, can our mechs fight our mutants? How does that work? Uh, and the answer is not really well uh, <laughs> because your mutants weren't doing, you know, SDC structural damage level powers. So anyway, <laughs> It worked that well. But um, it was fun. It was fun while it lasted. <laughs> I remember flipping through both of those books. So. Yeah. Wait, I, I just met some uh, players at Origins that were playing uh, Twilight. Uh, I forget what it's called. That's like the Third World War thing. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Twi- um, not, so uh, la, 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 la. I know which one you're talking about. Twilight 2000. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Twilight yeah, that's a game from the 80s as well, originally. Yeah. Is that the one where the nuke goes off and you're at you're like you have a map of the area and there's a whole bunch of charts or is that that one might just be called nuke from the eighties? <laughs> if you're talking about like an, an actual nuclear war that and it's a board game that's nuke. Okay. Um, it was around the same time to be honest. I think a couple of years earlier, but uh, no, Twilight uh, two thousand is like you're like a military unit, yes. uh, like a. Um, and you're like running ops or, or you were running ops and then stuff happened or something like that. I haven't played that one in literal decades, um, like probably 30 years since I played that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the, uh, what, what you made me think of when you, you were talking about, uh, like making the game work and all this is some of those people decided to get together and see if the encumbrance actually worked in the world. Cause they're like, we want this to be a realistic system. Oh. So, then, <laughs> so a bunch of simulationists, awesome. Yeah. So they, so they, 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 but they actually got like grenade launchers and stuff. <laughs> they, they got things that were decommissioned. I guess you, you can do that somewhere. I have no idea where. And they, I mean, they it's went, America, so I'm sure you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they went out and, they, and then they're like, "Okay, you're the best 
in shape out of all of us. How far can you run with that? And they made like one guy in their group like try to run and do all these different. <laughs> Please tell me this is on YouTube somewhere. I, 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 I doubt it. it. I doubt it. But oh but, man! But they were telling me about it, and they were like, "We hate an encumbrance, but we wanted to be realistic with our game, so we decided to do that." So that, that's just yeah. what. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that, that's, that's, I think that's totally fair to do, um, yeah. which is actually why I like more modular systems like loadout systems mm. uh, or a system like uh, Forge in the Dark, where it's like you have this many slots and this thing takes X slots and this thing takes X slots. And you're going to end up with roughly what is logically the limit for a human being to carry. Now, if you're not human, like if you're some kind of, you know, half giant or something, you got a whole different system, yeah. right? You have three more slots. Great. Let's do that. Uh, but the but calculating weight and now how does that affect my movement and all that kind of stuff was it, sometimes I, so simulationist stuff is a little bit beyond where I like to play as well. Um, and I, and that's what I think about like things like encumbrance and, you know, how much food do I need? And like, we never think about, you know, toilet paper. Huh? First Have you ever thing I pack when I go hiking. Paper? Well, you should. Because, <laughs> man, you forget about it once, and it's the first thing you pack every time you hike after that. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, whereas if you're dungeoneering, you never pack it. It's never a right. concern. I mean, I used to be a long distance runner, and um, you don't, you don't <laughs> worry about. Are you talk about, about bodily fluids? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. I mean, I'm just saying, you don't worry about toilet paper when you're a long distance runner either. You just do what you need to do. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. The, yeah. So, Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> these these t- tangents are totally fine. Uh, yeah, uh, I would I would. If you're gonna be a simulationist, you need to be like a a real simulator. You got to go with the full mile, I guess. But I am very impressed by that group who decided to go find decommissioned weapons and gears and tack up and figure out if they could carry it. Um, that's pretty funny. I just thought the, <laughs> the funniest thing about it was that like the, the the people in the group said that most of them couldn't carry most of it <laughs> well i mean yeah i mean i couldn't either i'm, I'm five foot two right oh, okay. um, i couldn't carry much of that at all it's uh but if you looked at like um not a drawing but an actual like person who is a soldier and how much gear they carry um or a tactical officer for like swat or something like that you can probably get a pretty good idea of you know hey you you probably can't carry three submachine guns and two handguns and seven, you know, smoke grenades. It's just, you're not going to be able to move and, and actually do your job. Right. You might carry it, but you're not doing anything functional right. with it other than carrying this stuff. Now you're a pack meal. You just made yourself into a pack meal. Yeah. My last uh, D and D character, well found a uh, uh, riffs character that passed away, carried four or five great swords, but they were a 14 foot Pikachu. <laughs> and um and foundry muscle bound pikachu but they were uh and foundry one time was like you're encumbered and i got like legit mad because like <laughs> i had gear and they had accidentally put the ship's weapons on my character sheet but then it like bumped and i was like i have like the biggest strength possible like how could i be encumbered <laughs> like i don't I, I made this character so i would never be encumbered and <laughs> Yeah. Did you go find like six great swords to see if you could carry them? Oh yeah, no, those were part of my character. I was actually trying to have the DM allow me to use the ship's lasers as, as your uh, personal weapons. Yeah, like take them off because it would have been cheaper than buying like my own laser and ship's lasers. <laughs> True. And I didn't wear armor. The party would have to be like, no, you have to put armor on. And I'm like, but I have this like uh, berserker cloth that works just <laughs> fine and they're like no you it doesn't protect from struck you know sdc damage right. and i'm like but i don't take damage i've never died <laughs> and i actually died from burning from there from you go <laughs> i didn't See die from never died from damage okay well yeah. there you go <laughs> but yeah uh, what, what is the hardest part of game design for you as, as you approach? Is it story writing? Is it those mechanics or what, what do you struggle it's with? Con- it's content actually. So um, generating content, uh, which is like more of the same thing uh, that I find tedious. Um, so if it's like, Hey, we need 40 weapons 
you know, written out. It's like, I'll write the first 10 and I'll make a template for, and I need somebody else to make the next 30 because I'm going to burn out uh, or whatever. Like if I had to think about every single stat for every single thing, like when we're talking about modern weaponry, there's a lot of stuff that goes into a modern weapon. Like what's its range? How much does it weigh? What's its ammo capacity? What's its cyclical fire rate? You know, what is it, you know, how do you do, can you, it do indirect fire with it with a combo under under over grenade launcher and rifle uh you know what's it like with the scope on it I mean, you have all these there's a lot um and if you're doing that for every single weapon and every single gun that exists in a world it's just pain and suffering <laughs> it really is and also a lot of it there's not a lot of differentiation between these two things right mm-hmm. so um do you again that's a question do you want to be a simulationist and say okay my AUG Steyr is very different than my HK, is very different than my whatever other brand of gun you have. Or is it very much like, you know, again, a, a blade system where it's like you have a fine submachine gun or you have a normal submachine gun. What's it going to be? Um, and you can tell me which one it is. It's just that's a fine one and that's a normal one because the fine one is is just, you know, calibrated to your trigger finger or whatever who knows uh but my point is that sometimes simple is better and you get to narratively decide what it is um but there are a lot of tech like gearheads out there who want to know each little part and each little thing i'm making a game um based on fast and furious not official (laughs) not official it's called grifters and drifters and uh my friend who is making it with me um he has gone hard into like car modifications Okay. And I originally set up the system where it's like, yeah, I have improved wheels. I have superb tires or whatever. Right. And he's like, no gearheads who want to play this game. If they're like really into gearheads into gear, they want to know like, Oh, I have, you know, I don't even know like this fuel injected, blah, blah, blah. And this blah, 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 blah terms. I don't know. Cause I'm not a car person, but he now knows them because he went and researched them all. Um, and that's cool and everything, I guess, uh, if you're into that and that's fine. Um, I, I think the game is made to, or hopefully will appeal to people who know some of that kind of stuff. Um, and then people who don't know that kind of stuff might learn that kind of stuff from it. And that's, that's okay. That's fine. I mean, honestly, the reason why I do know so many weapons is because of role playing games. <laughs> like the, my, my, my knowledge of weapons is fairly encyclopedic. Oh, that's a, that's an FN rifle, you know, <laughs> whatever, just by looking at it, I know what it looks like. Um, but it, it's, uh, the kind of thing where again, is that impeding gameplay or is that the most fun part of gameplay? So there are definitely some systems out there where making the character and outfitting them and kidding them out is more fun than actually playing the thing, which is, says something about the system. Um, but, uh, you know, how crunchy do you want the character making and how crunchy is the system? And are the two ever going to mesh with each other? So content is the hard thing for me. Uh, I don't mean adventure content. I mean, like just like stuff That's- that, you know, I now need to generate, you know, seven different types of motorcycles and five different types of you know, land vehicles that are not tanks. And now, oh, speaking of tanks, now let's do 12 types of tanks or whatever it is, right? So, um, and I get that there's an appeal in a lot of that for things like Mech Warrior or whatever, or Battletech, where you're running around in different types of mechs. The differentiation is about those mech. Um, but, uh, you know, do do I role play differently because I'm carrying, um, you know, uh, Desert Eagle versus a Colt 45. I don't know. There, there might be a different situations. They do at that level, they do literally have different ammunition capacities. But other than that, um, right. and there are other, there are, you know, other, other issues with, you know, um, a Desert Eagle, you know, the kickback on a Desert Eagle is different than a 45, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if somebody knows enough about that stuff, they may want to talk about that a lot, but does the whole table want to talk about that or need to talk about that? And is it something that needs to be handled mechanically? Is there enough granularity in your system to require that level of granularity, mm-hmm. uh, that, le- that level of detail, sorry? Or is the system uh, narratively something that we could say, oh yeah, because I'm using this when it kicks back, because I've never fired uh, you know, that gun 
before it, you know, I, 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 basically hit myself in the head with it as I fire it or, you know, silly things like that. You can narratively describe that. There may not be any mechanical difference if your system isn't granular enough to do that. And a lot of, you know, one shot type systems, the the granularity just isn't there. Um, You know, if all you have to pick from is lasers or feelings, you're not going to be able (laughs) to differentiate between, you know, is that a, you know, a photon torpedo or disruptor cannon? Who knows? Right. They do the same thing. It's all lasers. Those are both lasers. Yeah. They're positive vibes, man. Yeah. And that's okay. So you teach uh, to, how would you explain some of what we're talking about? I mean, do you explain some of what we're talking about to your, your students uh, uh, as far as hobby gaming? <laughs> so I, I, there are definitely students who are into Dungeons and Dragons and board games and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And they, they talk to me about that. Um, specifically though, the only thing I tell my students about my gaming stuff is that, hey, I also make games. And the only reason why I tell them that is because it's kind of cool. And the only reason why I tell them it's kind of cool is I want to show them, I, I want to show my students that it's possible to do cool stuff mm-hmm. even when um, I almost failed at a university. Um, so that's what I'm trying to show them is that uh, ad- you can overcome adversity and do cool stuff even after failing a few tests or even after failing a course or uh, because my students are so loss aversive that they like anything where it's a failure. It's like, oh, that's the end. I'm done. It's like, no, you got to you can keep on going. You can keep trying. You can do better. Uh, and one test failure, even one course failure is just going to it's just setting you back by a little bit. It's not this be all. It's not ending your life. Whereas a lot of them are like, my life is over. I'm done. Uh, or I'm dropping this course. Or I'm dropping the whole program. It's like, no, 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 no. Keep coming. Keep coming. You'll get past it if you try. Um, and so I just talk about game design because a lot of them think that's it's cool. I talk about, you know, I've designed a game for Batman because they all know what Batman is, right? So, right. yeah, but not, not a lot. My friend, Scott, who is another psych prof and uh, he develops games with me um in our development team he actually does a course on the psychology of board games which is fun um and i do a lot of when i do a lot of talks uh, about game design i'll often talk about the psychological theory theories behind why i design the way i design i i think for metatopia we're doing one about you know designing rewarding experiences and that's one of my areas of 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 research is on uh, behavioral psychology, but also on the um, theory of flow experiences, which is entirely what role playing is. Uh, flow experiences when, and how to keep in the flow. Keeping in what we call a flow channel is when your skills match the challenge, um, and that's basically like um, you know making sure that the GM is challenging the players at the right level so yeah your level one characters aren't fighting an ancient red dragon that's those characters are just going to be like this is stupid why am i even playing you know um and understanding that when you have those types of flow experiences from both the gm side and the player side you'll have maximum engagement and when maximum engagement happens you will lose track of time and you will not know how much time you spent because it's that good. Um, That's the experience that I'm always going for. Uh, When I talk about curating experiences, that's really where that comes from in terms of the psychology of how to do it is uh, looking at what we call the flow channel and making sure that you're matching that your game, the characters in game skills progress at the same level of, of the challenges that are presented. And in a board game, that's hard because it's automated by the by the game itself, right? Yeah. Whereas in a role playing game, um, it's harder and easier. It's harder because the GM has to be aware of that, but it's easier because there's a GM to do that. Um, so you can you can do that kind of stuff. There's actually even systems that I've been thinking about where you know it almost auto tunes the whatever villain it is to the level of the players. Uh, the challenge level of the players because of, you know, certain stats or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how do you make um, it really easy for the, for every scenario, every setting to be within a good level of challenge for the players. Uh, And I mean, this whole, this whole chapters of that, even in the dungeon masters guide, there's like a whole chapter on just how to do that uh, using like 
DC roles and using like the, what's it called? The, in the old, in olden days, it was hit dice, you know, the number of hit dice, but there's like a CR. Is, yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. that's it. challenge okay. ratings. Um, so, and, and they, they, they often fail um, because, um, you know, it, it's, it depends on party size and all, all sorts of other things. So anyway, that, that is uh, a goal of mine some days to figure out how to make a system that actually meets those types of things. So a, a GM or a, or a system could pull out a encounter that would challenge everybody adequately. Keep I've been wanting to run a dungeon where the goblins act like goblins instead of just acting like um, something to be stabbed. Yeah. And, and just just brutalize some players with it. And be like, I don't know, man, there's only like 15 goblins and they're not attacking. You're just in the shadows <laughs> shooting you like a goblin <laughs> would do instead yeah. of being like... <laughs> I run into battle with, you know, a little knife and no armor. <laughs> and you get beaten down all the time. <laughs> you know? Like you enter the goblin lair, man. Like you, you're getting smoked. Yeah, you see none of them. <laughs> they are yeah, hiding, yeah, yeah. and they're like throwing dung and flaming dung at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a giant rock rolling, you know, like some Indiana Jones, but smaller scale. Yeah. But you're <laughs> first awesome. level, so. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite narrative experience? And we'll, 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 we'll limit it because we've talked a lot about our, our RPGs. Do you have a fair, favorite narrative experience in board games from somebody else's games? Because uh, I, I like hearing what people have enjoyed in other people's sure. games who are designers too. Because it, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I would be remiss not to mention things like Pandemic Legacy. Mm-hmm. So all the legacy games, um, well, Pandemic Legacy for one, for sure. Uh, is it like just blew my mind um, as I played it, and it's it's like this is what is possible with a little extra love, right, and a little extra production value, and I, and I think that's what we're seeing now um, in ga- in modern more modern games because Pandemic Legacy was you know several years ago now, um, and games that come after that have really kind of elevated the 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 storytelling aspects. Now, a lot of it is still just story reading, honestly, or paragraph choosing, like yeah. uh, choose your own adventure style stuff. And that's okay. Um, I, I would just like to have more uh, narrative control as a player or that the char- the players are like, are basically like, t- actually the game is to tell a story, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I do have a system that we're working on called mythos the mythos system that does that it's just a long time coming uh just because we keep on pulling parts out of it and putting new parts back in so that's just us being silly um but yeah i, I think uh pandemic legacy has has done it above and below uh ryan lookout red raven all, all the games that he's been doing lately uh with his wife have been wonderful and have been really you know they're building a world like the art is all uh, integral to it um the storylines kind of intermerge um some of the they started it was, it was really it's interesting like if you look at it and you look at the you know the greatest games chronologically um you'll see that they're the first couple of games there's like there's no narrative in them <laughs> other than like the little bits of lore that he sticks in and then eventually you're making some choices but they don't actually have any in-game um, effect at all, really, not much. Then the game after that's like, oh, okay, now you're making choices, and that changes what resources we get, or something like that. So he's progressing with every game. You know, just how much the choice in telling story changes the game, um, which is really cool. Uh, there's a new one that's coming out called Tiles of the Arabian Nights, uh, which is, I think, really just re envisioning the old Arabian Nights game. Uh, that was like random fest, but people love it because it's just, you know, I'm going to spend the hour and a half telling wacky stories. Uh, and I think this new one is kind of going to codify it a little bit better. So they aren't as wacky. Um, I like a lot of the narrative stories that are like, you know, consulting detective style stories because uh, I like escape rooms. Um, and so a lot of the board game um, escape rooms and puzzles um, 
they have some of them anyways, not all of them. Some of them have no story whatsoever um, or very loose stories, but a lot of them now have better stories, uh, which is the whole point of my, the series that I did called Coded, Coded Chronicles, mm-hmm. which are I, all IP based. So we did The Shining, mm-hmm. uh, Scooby-Doo and uh, the Goonies is the one that's just coming out. And that's where I've, I've written like pages and pages of story for those yeah. to tell the story through the eyes of the characters. Um, and that was pretty fun, but, uh, other one, other, other people have done a lot of good stuff too. Yeah. No, I, I was just gonna say, I was gonna make a Scooby Doo joke, but honestly, it's a really fun game. <laughs> oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Um, David Neal and Matt Dunstan do a lot of work in puzzle and story combined. Mm-hmm. So they have this new thing coming out. I haven't played it yet, uh, called the echo system. Uh, it's, uh, cosmos. Cosmos being the publisher and they did Cosmos also did a lot of their um, exit series, which are just escape room in boxes that have like really loose stories. They're not great storytelling, uh, but uh, the ecosystem uses hearing. Right. And I see both of your heads go, huh? That's neat. Right. And yeah. so they, they're like adding an extra bit of that. And then um, Matt and Dave also did the adventure series in uh, that cosmos put out which is very similar to coded chronicles in the way that it's like it's we're we're all trying to emulate like point and click adventures Mm -hmm. uh which also was like i think cantaloupe did a great job of that um oh a really cool board game that had some really cool narrative bits um was micro macro did you see that yep where it's this giant map and it's like (laughs) little cute drawings of like anthropomorphic characters that kill each other apparently yeah. and you got to solve the crimes and it's really really well done and the stories aren't you know they're not super stories but they're enough of a narrative to like help you solve the crime and make give you like a motive a means and an opportunity uh to fit the fit the narrative uh, of most crime stories so i played that with my younger son who's like 13 and he's like this is great uh because it was just enough narrative to keep him engaged in and the puzzle finding and the puzzle solving of it was really cool too i I think they they really hit on something special when they figured out that we can draw in sequence like what they did on the map is they draw one character and then they draw it again at where it's going to be at the next step and they draw it again at the, the step, the third, fourth, five, you know, it's 10 steps later. And you get to track this character moving around the map and watch it drop things and pick up things and jump into a car. Now you have to follow the car through the city and all this kind of stuff. And it's really, really cool. So there's yeah. a second version coming up too. And apparently I didn't think about this. My friend has colored the map and she's going, oh. yeah, we, we colored the whole map and it was awesome. Cause now their map looks beautiful. <laughs> that's a great idea no yeah. I, uh, I i need to show ryan that because uh, i ended up putting um i always mix up the the words it, it, not the chemistry field but this but was it the chemistry field or the game of the year i don't know to go to jar yeah it won it won i don't know i always mix up the names it won one of the oh yeah um it uh yeah it was definitely either nominated or won parts of one of those things yeah anyway it, it, yeah. It, it, it's great my nine-year-old loves it because he's mm-hmm. like here's the murderer and he's all happy. The murderer is all happy over here. And then, like, you find the murderer later on. <laughs> yeah, without giving it all away. But yeah, you're, you're, yeah, it's a really cool system. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and it, I don't know. People get people get in, uh, interesting opinions because there's a lot of debate. Like, oh, why is this even a game? Um, but like it had it had a start, it had a middle, and it had an end, and it had rules to it, and you could win. So why is it not a game? Um, yeah, people are very caught up in putting things in buckets that don't necessarily need to put buckets. Yeah, uh, like a game is a much wider thing than a lot of people give it cre- give give the term credit for. Um, I think a lot of what you're saying is exactly true. You know, did you can it be one? <laughs> are there some rules to it? Yeah. Good. Let's let's go. <laughs> so, well, we'll uh, we we want to respect your time. Anything else that you want to share with us before we head out tonight? No, I mean, this is great. I just like talking, so it's been well, good to to meet you both. Yeah, nice to meet you. Hopefully, we'll we'll see you when uh, borders open up again. Uh, 
someday. Yeah, we'll actually see each other in person instead of yeah. on Zoom. <laughs> It'll be wonderful. Yeah. Um, so thank you. I'd enjoy that. Thank you so much. Are, are you? Is there anything that you can share that you're gonna be having coming out soon that, that people should check uh, out? Depending on the date of airing, we are yeah. launching a, another Kickstarter soon. Uh, myself and Banana Chan have a game with Hunters. So Hunters being the publisher behind Kids on Bikes, Kids on Brooms, Alice is Missing. Uh, we're doing a drawing RPG, a drawing RPG if you were um, Simon from SNL or from the cartoon. Uh, <laughs> it's called An Exquisite Crime uh, and it's about murder because everything we do is about murder, death, destruction um, and very funny coming off of Micro Macro uh, where you're using, I don't know, do you guys remember what exquisite corpses are? Do you know what an exquisite corpse is? You've done it. I guarantee you've done them. Uh, not calling you murderers, but it's okay. an exquisite corpse is a surrealist movement art st strategy or technique where uh, you fold a piece of paper uh -huh. and then one person draws one part that connects to another part that another yeah, person yeah, drew yeah, yeah. that okay. connects to another person that another person drew. So those games, um, they're telling the story of murder in a certain part. Uh, a certain surreal world where like, you know, it's like 1820 London, except whales are in the sky or something like that, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah. A little more fleshed up than that. Uh, but um, you're psychic detectives and you are cooperating to figure out who was murdered. Why were they murdered? Where were they murdered? Who are the suspects? Who are the witnesses to this crime? And so you're drawing all these characters and things by doing this exquisite corpse um, and it's, it's brilliant. Actually, it's really super fun. Uh, I love keepsake games. I love mementos. I love physical uh, artifacts made in games. My mom, uh, my mom, we're cleaning up their house to, to move cause they're getting old. Uh, they're actually quite old. Um, and they are getting ready to sell their house. And my mom's like, do you want this? And she, you know, hands me a binder. It was like D and D stuff from when I was like eleven years old or nine years old or something. It's like yes, I want all of it, and I just you know sat one night and looked at it. And it's like all my maps that I drew meticulously on graph paper during math class, of course, because that's when I had graph paper and I didn't really care about math. Um, so all that stuff was there, and it's like just brings back so many memories. Mm. So I try in most of my RPGs that I'm the one that was responsible for making them. If I'm the like a co-designer on it or a primary lead designer, it's probably going to have a memento, in it. <laughs> like something that you create. That's the character sheets enough for some people, but I like a little bit more. So did you, did you have to draw something that was game relevant? Did you have to write something that was relevant to what happened in the game? Uh, I think that kind of stuff is really, really useful. So that's coming out sooner than later on Kickstarter. And it's called An Exquisite Crimes by myself and my partner in crime, Banana Chan. And it's going to be published by Hunter's Renegade. That sounds slick. Yeah. I stopped buying RPG books, um, but I, I'm, I'm getting sold on these and I'm feeling brave. I had a big box, you know, my, my shelf of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like 10 years ago, I donated it and said, I got to stop doing this because I moved a lot and you just have these con RPGs that are small and I've always adored those, but yeah, I, I, I haven't made a zine yet, but I'm really into the idea of zines. I'm, I, I, I bought a zine for idea. a friend because I love yeah. them so much, but I don't want to own one because then I'll feel guilty. Because <laughs> then you'll just, I need to have them all now. <laughs> They're like Pokemon, like big, strong, muscular Pikachus. 14 foot tall, just yep. flexing. Just you know, this is my zine collection. <laughs> That's why I actually bought this shirt as we previewed. I, I didn't want to buy their oh. game because I didn't want it to be on my shelf, but I wanted to support them. And I thought that their propaganda from their game was fun, <laughs> but it was, it was cyberpunk. Yeah. Uh, cyberpunk stuff is totally cool. And I, I think that's, uh, I, so more and more I am getting like digital copies of stuff, uh, because I do want it. I just don't have the space for all the games all the time. So I reserve like buying hard copies for, you know, games that my friends might've made or something like that, or like source books with like amazing color art in it or whatever. Um, so I do have some recent ones, but 
not all of them. Uh, and some things are like, you know, digital sometimes actually works better for the style of play anyway, because the PDF is like immediately searchable or whatever. So mm-hmm. most of the games I've bought in like the last three years are games that I have play tested before they were published. Then mm-hmm. I'm back to Kickstarter or people that we've been talked to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's fair too. Right. I, I think it's, I think we need to support new uh, artists and designers in the field. Um, and then it just depends, you know, is this a product that I'm going to want to lovingly hold and caress, or is it something I can look at on the screen of my iPad? That's the question I ask myself. I'll still buy probably the thing, but it's just what version of said thing do I need? Absolutely need. Uh, but the thing is that I think a lot of RPG designers know that there are people like me who are like suckers for like beautiful product. And so there are a lot of super neat products out there these days. Uh, I'm a sucker. The other thing that gets me, by the way, just before we go, is yeah, if yeah. you are an RPG writer and you say, hey, I have a tier on Kickstarter where you can donate a copy to a library or a school or a youth center, I will do that every time. <laughs> Because I'm a huge believer in supporting, uh, okay. you know, school groups and you know church groups and whatever to have access to games and materials. So will it, will an exquisite murder have that tier? That is a really good question. Uh, I don't run the Kickstarter, but I will suggest it. I will strongly oh, suggest that. it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Because I think that that is a a really nice way of, of broadening the community. Um, I love it when you know, tiers are like, if you buy it this tier, which is like maybe like a dollar more than the regular tier, we'll, all, we'll, just, we'll do the same thing, but we'll add a community copy for people who can't afford the, you know, $15 or whatever. Uh, yeah. Because there are a lot of people who can't and they still deserve games, right? So, and that, that is the nice thing about the role-playing community that's very different than the board gaming community because, you know, the board gaming community is, it is a physical thing and, you know, I can't give you parts of it without giving you all of it. And then I don't have it. Whereas in the art role-playing scene, a lot of people are just passing PDFs around anyway. So why don't we make people feel good about it and, you know, get a little bit for it if we need to do that. Um, Because we know that people are just going to give each other PDFs anyway. So for the price of less than a cup of coffee, you know, you can support your local RPG designer. Yeah, right. Because I, I think people need that. There's a there's a lot of people who this is this is their thing. This is what they do, mm-hmm. uh, and they're prolific and they do a lot of it. Um, but every little bit counts towards helping them. And that's it's progressing of an art, right? Are you a patron of an art yeah. form? I believe RPGs are art. I believe games are a form of art. So and if you don't believe that, you can come and fight me. I'm just kidding. You don't have to come fight. Me. <laughs> well, I don't know if we want to fight you because you're a, a black belt. Uh, yeah, professor of jujitsu. Professor yeah, of jiu-jitsu. A Brazilian jujitsu. That's right. Yeah, I don't oh. think we want to fight you. You probably so, don't. <laughs> I am very small though, so if you're big, um, uh, I'm really I'm good at getting you beat though. up. So that's my skill. <laughs> I can take a beating. Oh well, see, the, the thing about jujitsu is that we don't actually beat you; we just choke you or break your joints. Oh no, those these are I have like a brace on already. I don't even yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have like you have like like things to paint and build and yeah, don't do that. I, know. I need to reverse the the the, the just pop something, you know. There's probably <laughs> something that can be popped. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate Anytime. your time. It was really nice to meet you both. <laughs> really nice to meet you too. Thank you.